Well, good morning. Welcome to City Church. We're super excited that you're here today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about the promised land. The promised land. Well, last night, uh, I actually was woken up multiple times by my dog, Hank. We call him Hanky Baby. He's a big mutt. And uh, anyways, he broke out of his kennel, and he's scratching at the basement door, and he keeps scratching at the door. So I woke up around 12, and then woke up around 2, and he's still scratching and running around in the basement. And I didn't want to deal with him, so I was like, I'll just let him hang out in the basement all night. And then I didn't hear him for a little while. I was like, oh, good. He finally went back to bed or something. Well, uh, he comes running in my room at 4.30 in the morning and jumps up on my bed and wakes me up, and he's sopping wet. And I'm like, what in the world just happened? How did he go from the basement to now upstairs, and how in the world did he get so wet? I mean, he's just drenched. Well, I got up and, and uh, went to the front door, and the front door of the house was open. And so he, he actually... Went out of the basement, he moved the slider, he unlocked the slider door last night and pushed his way through there, went out into the neighborhood in the middle of the snowstorm and just hung out and was just, you know, just enjoying the promised land of actually running the neighborhood. You know, he loves to do that. And then he came home and he opened the front door, which is so funny because I have it on my ring camera but the funniest part about it is, is he opened the front door of the house and then he just sat on the porch because he was just loving life. This is, this is a dream of his. He gets to just run around the neighborhood and do whatever he wants. And so that's why he was sopping wet. That's why he woke me up in the morning because he actually opened two doors last night. This, this dog is, is crazy smart, but it's, it's his promised land. I mean, it, it's everything that he could ever want and ever hope. He could just run the neighborhood and do whatever he wants in neighbor's yards and just have fun all night long. Well, what's your promised land? You know, what, what's the dream that, that God's given you, the, the plan, the purpose that, that you're waiting for? Or maybe you're there. Maybe you've arrived. There's a lot of, a lot of my life right now that I... But just, you know, as I was praying about this message, just realize there's so much God has done. And I'm really living in the promised land. This, is a, this has been a promise of his. And notice I'm using the word promised. Because what happened was eight years ago of my life, um, the Lord just really promised that he was going to be with my wife and I and my family as we planted a church. He put it on our hearts to plant a church. Uh, he gave my wife dreams of the church. He, he gave us an amazing team to start the church off with. And look, Neil, I'm going to actually like follow through on this promise. And so we have literally been dependent on the promise of God for the last eight years that this was his idea. City Church has always been his idea. This was, this was his model. This was his vision. This was his location. It's his promise. And so we've had to rely on that. And sometimes it's really hard because, you know, when you rely on a promise of God, it, it normally costs you something. So for, for myself and my family, it, it cost me leaving a, a full-time job that, that was really good, a well-paying job, and to work for the church for free. And then it, it also cost us, like, we had to sell everything that we had to pay the rent for the church and to help pay financial things that... It costs to start a church. And so I literally sold all the stuff that I had been, <laughs> been storing up, my little treasure of musical equipment on this earth. I had to sell it all. But it was all dependent on what is God's promise. You know, God promised that he's going to be with us, and this is what he was doing. And he made it really clear through multiple people, through dreams, through prayer, through uh, wisdom, through wise counsel. This is what I'm doing. So do you trust in my promise? And so we're really living in the promised land because God has totally came through. It hasn't been easy. It's actually been really hard. But we're living in the promises of God today. And you see that in the life of David as we as we close this chapter in, in this church of, of discovering the life of David, 
you see that he finally makes it to the promised land. God is Elhana Iman. He is Elhana Iman, which his name means that he is a faithful God. So you see in David's life that he was actually called that he's going to be the next king of Israel. And there was a promise set over his life. The Lord used Samuel to come to David and say, you're the next king of Israel at the age of 13. And so David has had to walk through so many different obstacles for the last 17 years, but we're going to actually close out this chapter in this month of David with him actually becoming king, that he steps into the promised land of God, what God had promised for him to do. So what I'd love for us to read today is, is this, is 2 Samuel 5 is, is the passage that we're going to be looking at. And we're going to look at what does it look like when David actually steps into the promise of God. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1 says, All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. So in other words, David is from this tribe. This is where David is called. This is who David was a part of. We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the leaders of Israel had came to David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over Israel and Judah 33 years. So it finally happened. David becomes the anointed king. Remember, he was anointed by Samuel in the beginning when he was a 13-year-old kid. And now 17 years have passed. Have you ever waited on a promise of God? Oh, God, you're, you're calling me into this, or you're going you're gonna to do this in my family, or um, you, you're sending me to this location. Maybe it's a mission, and you're waiting on the promise of God, and it just doesn't seem to be adding up. Nothing's really going uh, in your time frame. <laughs> well, here's David. For 17 years, he was promised to be king of Israel. He served Israel. He loved Israel. He served them as a warrior. And, and nothing has really worked out in his time frame. But yet alone, David, here we are 17 years later, God is faithful to his promise. And he anoints king. He's anointed David as king. Notice that it says that he's anointed as king of Judah first. And so Judah is actually the separate region. Those countries haven't become one yet. And so when David was anointed as king of Judah, it's a much smaller little section of Jerusalem. And so when he's anointed as, as king, he's actually anointed with another test, another trial. David, will you be faithful with little? Have you ever been there before? It's like you get a little taste and a little glimmer, a little, little bit of hope. I'm actually fulfilling my promise in you, but it's not exactly this promised land it's, it's like a portion of the promised land that I promised you. And so you see that David like loves Judah. He loves them because they're, they're his own people. But it's just a section of what God wants to do in David. So he serves diligently. Can I trust you with little? Because if I can trust you with little, I'm going to give you a lot. And so David rules Judah well as king. And then God opens up the door for him to rule Jerusalem, all of the countries, under one king, David. I just love that, that even when he's anointed as, oh, finally, ah, retirement. <laughs> uh, it's a little portion of retirement, you know, whatever, maybe, oh, man, I went through all this schooling to finally arrive to this point in my career it's like, it's a little portion of the promise. So David gets a little portion of it, and 
He, notice he doesn't throw a fit about that. He loves those people and he rules them well that he becomes king of Jerusalem after seven and a half more years. It's another trial. David, I'm trusting you, but I'm going to give you a little bit first and then I'm going to trust you with a lot. These are God's people. And so he, he trusts David a little bit, uh, gives him a, a task that's just a portion of what he's got for him. So David rules and reigns for 40 years. He stands in the promised land for 40 years as king. He actually gets to live there, be with his people, love them the way that God loves them. He wanted to rule the people as the Lord ruled through his life. So he, he was a, a man after God's own heart. So his heart was for people. He loved people. But I want to look at something that is just so cool. When David finally becomes king of Jerusalem, the very first thing, one of the first things that he does is he says, we got to get God back in our city. You know, so like I see this as is David ruling from the mountaintop. You know, David in the book of Psalms, you see that he writes a lot of times from the valley. And man, David's life was up and down a lot like yours and I and mine. Just so many ups and downs. And so here's David. He's riding from the mountaintop. He's finally king. All the promises of God have come true. God is Elhana Iman. He has been faithful to David. So he's finally king. But what does he do? Now that he's finally arrived, well, he says, we got to get God back here. We need his presence. We got to go after the ark. And so in his ambition to, to make this happen is he goes to try to recover the ark. And the Bible says that he built a new cart. And that new, that word new actually means something there because it means that, okay, this is the old custom way of building an ark or getting the ark and moving it around. You have to have a certain protocol that God God actually wrote out for his presence. And to move the ark, you have to, you have to do it in God's way. And David's like, I'm going to build a new ark because we got to hurry up and get his presence back here. So he builds a new cart. It doesn't work out very well at all. <laughs> and he sets the ark aside and says, like, that didn't work out. We got to come up with a new solution. Oh, yeah, let's go back to the original way of moving the ark. So I'd love for us to read in 2 Samuel uh, verse 16, it says, it says this, this is the new way of how he's getting the Ark of the Covenant back to the city. Verse 16 says, as the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, notice it's now the city of David. He's the king, he's changed the name of the city, we're going to call this place the city of David. Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from the window and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in the place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name Lord Almighty. We finally got the presence of God back in the city of David. Look, I'm king. We're not going to try to do this on our own. I need God's presence. Isn't this amazing? And you see David is, is dancing before the Lord, and he's, and he's blessing people because the presence of God is back. It's back in our city, guys. Then he gave a loaf of bread and a cake and dates and cake, cake of raisins to each person and the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. So not only did they get the presence of God, but their king is saying, isn't this a joyous occasion? It's like a birthday party for God. Like he's back in our city. Everybody gets a cake. I don't understand one thing in this, in this sentence, though, uh, in this chapter. Or verse 19, it says that, they got cakes with raisins in them. Like, why, why would you do that to people, David? I don't, I don't get that. But anyways, they all got cakes, and they all got blessed to go home. Like, have a great night. Isn't this been amazing? We're all blessed. Well, look at what David walks home to. 
Look at what David walks in on. When David returned home to bless his household, so he's been so busy and preoccupied blessing everyone else. We're in the promised land. The presence of God is back. Isn't this amazing? And he's coming back to his household to bring this blessing. When he returns back to his household to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in view of the slave girls of the servants as a, any vulgar fellow would. In other words, what the Bible says is while David was out there dancing, that he was dancing so mightily that it wasn't like he was actually naked, but like his outer garments had fallen off because they're just getting in the way of him dancing. You know, he, he took off his jacket, he took off his robe, and, and he's dancing in, in kind of, uh, in his, <laughs> in kind of a, uh, a, a gown that would, would still cover him. But, but he was dancing so mightily that he, he looked like everyone else and, and somebody that is just super excited about what God was doing. He, he, he couldn't be contained with his clothes at this time. David said to Macau, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people of Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Look, look, your dad didn't have this right. You know, I'm dancing because it's my God. It, your dad's decided to like put the Ark of the Covenant in and just kind of let other people have it. The people that stole it, they just, he just let them have it. Like We don't even really need that here. But David says, no, it, it, the reason I'm dancing like this, the reason that I am so excited about God's presence being back in the city is because that's my heart. It's always been my heart. This is God who brought me here. This is the mountaintop. We are in the promised land. So like your father didn't get it right, and I'm not really expecting you to understand this either. Nor did anybody in his household. But what God did is he put it on my heart that I am a man after God's own heart. And so of course I'm going to be dancing like this because I'm excited about what God is doing. And then he says, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. And I just, I don't care what you think of me, but it's me and God in his presence. And it's something that I desire so much. And, and I'm very aware that he's the one that's gotten me through all of the trials that has gotten us to this point to be in the promised land. So I'm going to be even more undignified than this. So if you didn't like that, you're probably not going to like what's going to happen next. <laughs> David's finally in the promised land. It's all he's ever wanted. It's all he was, he was called, he was blessed, he was, he was ordained. He was anointed to be the king of of Jerusalem and he does it he ends up there and he rules and he reigns for 40 years God was with David throughout this entire process from anointing him at 13 years old to the time where he actually becomes king God has been with him. He's been working on David. He's been preparing his character. He's, he's been with him as he's chased. He's ridiculed. He's, he's chased throughout all of the region. He went from town to town to town, running away from Saul. But God was with him. Look, David, I've called you to this, and I'm not going to leave you. I'm always going to be with you. And so, you know, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like the storyline that most of us would dream of to, to be like David. Oh, I really want to be like David. Well, I don't know that we want to go through the stuff David went through. The storyline of David is he's anointed, but then his life is just all these trials and tribulations that he's faced. And so I know when, when we think of David and we kind of recap on this month of we think of David and we're always talking about him being king. We, we think of King David. 
But the thing with King David is there wouldn't be King David if there wasn't persistent David. There, there wouldn't be King David if, if he would have thrown in the towel because things weren't going in the way that he wanted to. We think of King David, but what I would like to think of is persistent David that trusted the Lord. Because he was so persistent at this is what God has called. These are the people that are around me. I'm going to love them. I'm going to bless those who curse me. I'm going to uh, see the good in people even, even when, I, <laughs> when they're attacking me. We have persistent David who, who pursued the Lord with all of his life. Pursued God's plans. This is why we have King David today. Because he cooperated with God's faithfulness and God's calling. You know, God can make a, a promise to us to be in the promised land, but it really is us cooperating with him in that. There's a part of that that, okay, God, I'm going to surrender and submit to what your will and your way is. And so that's what you see in David as, as people submit to the Lord and they cooperate with what God does in their life, there's this promise that's always in front of them of a promised land. And it really is a choice for each one of us to, to choose the promised land or to choose our own way. And I'm not saying like God will totally like, he'll take that 180 turn to come back to the promised land. But there really is a choice in us to go, you know what, God, I do want to pursue what it is that you have for my life. I do want to be holy. I do want to be righteous. I do want to pursue you with all of my heart. There really is a choice in us that we get an opportunity to do that, that I'm going to bring my worries and my frustrations to you in prayer. That's a choice that we get to have. And then what happens is God repurposes our heart. He changes our character. That when we step into the promised land, the very first thing we want to do is praise the Lord. And so it's a choice that each one of us get to make. And, and you get to make it right now. I get to make it. I can either choose to live for myself or I can live for God's promises. Because God's promises are endless. They don't end. They just keep going. I would love to just share a story with you uh, and just at, in closing of, of a young woman, a young woman who, who was barren and she couldn't have any children and, it, and she really wanted to have children for her husband and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't working out. And so she actually went to, she went to the temple to worship God and, and in a moment of of desperation she she was worshiping the lord and and the bible says that her lips were moving but nothing was coming out of her mouth have you ever been there in prayer like i don't even know what to say right now and so this is how desperate she was for the lord to make this move for for something to happen in her internally that she could have children and so she's, she's in prayer, and, and she's worshiping God, and, and she's trying to, you know, relate and, and, and tell the Lord what was going on in her life, and God, will you please give me a child? And even so much that the priest of the temple came over to her and goes, hey, are you drunk or something? I mean, she was that desperate, and that, that, that was that, that um, her heart was so impacted that she needs, she needs to bring it to the Lord, and so... She makes a request to God, God, will you give me a child? And if you do, I will dedicate him to you. He can serve you with all of his life. And so the Lord heard her request and, and made her a promise. I will give you a son. And he does, and he falls through on, on giving her a son. And so her son is born and after she raises him for a while and and gets him ready that he can actually go and serve the lord in the temple and dedicate him to the temple that he's going to be a servant of god he's going to be a priest he's going to be a prophet after she raises the son that he's able to do that on his own she takes him to the temple and dedicates him that here's your son that this is the child that you gave me. Thank you for blessing me with the time that I've had with him, but I'm giving him back to you. And, and so she gives the son away, and he serves in the temple under the other priests and the other prophets. 
that son was Samuel. Samuel is the, is the same Samuel that anointed David and, and made a promise from God that David, at 13 years old, you're going to be the next king of Israel. You know, because Samuel was promised to his mom, and then Samuel, his mom followed through on the promise and dedicated Samuel. Now that Samuel can go out and make promises of God to others. You know, it just keeps going on, and it keeps going on, and it keeps going on. David has promised that that is through his bloodline, through his lineage, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was going to be born. And if you read in Matthew and if you read in Luke, you will see that it's through the bloodline of David, King David, who was promised to be king at 13, that that same exact promise that God fulfilled the promise in Jesus Christ when he was born through Mary and Joseph, which was the bloodline of David. It just keeps going on. It just keeps getting better. God is a God of promises, and he promises us eternal life. He promises us the promised land that all of us dream of where there's no more pain, there's no more hurting, there's no more sorrow. And he makes that promise to you and I. And he says, will you trust me in this? Because I'm Elhana Iman. I have your best. I know it may not look the way that you thought it was going to look. And and life may seem like, I don't know how that promise is ever going to be fulfilled. But he's at work right now. He's at work right now in you. The same way that he did in David. The same way he did in Samuel. The same way that he did in Jesus. That he's always at work. And his promises are true. We get to inherit the promised land. And so today, it's, it's a choice. It's the gospel message all over again. Every single week, it's the gospel message. Will you trust Elhana Iman, the faithful God, with the promises that he gives you, that he'll never leave you, that you've never ran too far away from him? He tells us the story of the prodigal son who runs away from everything, but the father is always waiting. And that's our father today. He just waits for us, like, come home. Come home. I love you. You've never ran too far away. There's always blessing in my house. And so surrender your life today. Step into the promises of God. If you've never done that, today's the day to do it. Don't wait another day. Why? It's the most fulfilling, Jesus' promise of our life, the best life possible with Jesus Christ is the most fulfilling, the most impactful, the most purposeful life that you've always wanted. You know what? It's the most intimate relationship that all of us are drawn to. And it's Jesus. It's in his promise. And so do that today. Trust Elhana Iman. The faithful God. What's really cool about that mom, and the Lord revealed that to me, is uh, I have goosebumps. (laughs) Um, I know it's us. But uh, the mom that gave away her son is named Hannah. He is El Hannah Iman and. Hannah gave away her son, Samuel, who anointed David, who David lives out the blessings of God and has more promises over his life. He is Elhana, Iman. He's done it so many times in the past. He's going to do it for you. He's faithful. He loves you. Trust him today. With whatever that means, whether you're on the mountaintop like David today or whether you're in the valley, trust the Lord. This too shall pass if you're in the valley. He's going to work things out for good. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that we've just been able to discover the life of David this this month and just spend so much time just talking about your faithfulness. And so Elhana Iman, Elhana Iman, 
You are faithful, God. So I just pray that over every single person that's listened to this message, that we would just take this truth of your word that you're always working things out for your good. You're always bringing us closer to you. And so we just choose to just cooperate with that. Whatever that looks like, whether it's trusting you with our family today, whether it's trusting you with our finances today, whether it's trusting you with our lives today for the very first time and just saying, Jesus, come into my life and I choose to just give you my life. Whatever it means for us today, Lord, we thank you that you're faithful. You're so good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys and hope to see you soon. Have a blessed week.